Hello there and welcome to a new Aftertrance edition. My name is Wim Mittes and tonight on Friday the 28th of August 2015 I've recorded the Beethoven Sonata Opus 2 number 1. It's 11 o'clock in the evening. We just finished and it has been a rather exhausting week with a lot of meetings and a lot of kilometers to drive and so I was rather crazy crazy to have the idea to record this sonata the first one of Beethoven but I must say I'm very happy that I did it and this sonata is a sonata that is that is not um, how would I say developed in a way that I could be rather confident that within a year I would play it in the same way. I explain myself in a minute. Um, you will have noticed that I'm playing on a different instrument as usual. This is the private instrument of Jure Spotfliege. And we changed instruments for the simple reason that my instrument is at his workshop. Um, all in preparation for the uh, for the uh, re recording label. As you might have noticed, we have also a vlog series called the Studio Project, where I discuss uh, a bit the, the the road to our recording studio and the own label. And since I think starting uh, that label with the six partitas of Bach, I, the instrument must be in top condition and it is actually but some keys were making a little bit too much noise and so yours is fixing that and in the meantime i have this instrument which is actually built in the same year my instrument is number 35 this is 37 that has a date 2010 but that's that is just fake it's, it's finished in 2009 i think we just finished the uh, the name here 2010 anyway the both instruments uh, were in this workshop next to each other. It's a little bit later. So what's different here, just a few words, it is an instrument with all options, so to say. Uh, you see this beautiful inlay. So that's very nice craftsmanship. Uh, my instrument is rather sober. I wanted it that way. Um, of course, it has a financial uh, Consequent as well because this is a lot of lot of work and it's very beautiful wood So what's the other thing that is different is this instrument is a little bit longer about 12 12 centimeters and which is For tuning as you can see almost the maximum that's possible and uh, I think some players must must have an assistant to uh, to tune the bass notes. So for me, it's just okay then the soundboard, you see the, how do you call it in English, the grain is going in that direction from one corner to the other and not in the direction of the instrument. This has, has consequence that you have um, yeah, a kind of less blending sound uh, where my instrument is a kind of butter-like feeling, like you have this sound and it's coming all together, it's gluing together. Here you have a uh, what separates um, the register, so to say, uh, and they keep very much separated. It's difficult to get a sound that's glued together, but on the other hand, it's very transparent. Um, it has a you could say this is a very nice eight foot instrument compared to an organ, whereas my instrument is maybe a 16 foot instrument. You could say it's a little bit later as a type of instrument. So the Beethoven um, I think is a good choice um, showing you the instrument. So Beethoven Opus 2 number 1. This is the first Beethoven sonata. Big Beethoven sonata. Uh, you have three of them. Opus 2 number 1, number 2 and number 3. Opus two, this one of And then you have Opus 2 number 2, it's a very beautiful piece as well. And so on, and then you have of course Opus 2. That's number 3. 
I thought Beethoven wrote these three sonatas uh, very early, he was only 25, 26, 24 maybe even, and in that time he had some lessons from Joseph Haydn. And these three sonatas, not only the three sonatas, but all parts of these sonatas, they differ from each other, they are very different. And not only from within them, this music uh, itself, but compared to what was written before. And, uh, I, I must say, when I was uh, starting with the clavichord uh, back to, in 2010 to 2009, I played a lot of Mozart. And only after months, actually, almost a year, I thought that might be interesting to try music of Beethoven. Uh, you must imagine that even today, uh, music of Beethoven is it's not very usual to play on clavichord. Eh? But I started with, with uh, just to play the sonatas and it was really a shock to me uh, coming from Mozart and the music of Mozart is developing at the end of his career it was very new actually it was conceived Mozart was, was a very modern composer it was, and then came Beethoven and then Beethoven of course wanted to study at, with Mozart but he went to Haydn obviously Mozart died when he came uh, for the second time in Vienna. And I always wondered what Haydn must have taught. I mean, these three sonatas, let's assume that they were not composed at the same time, but Beethoven came at Haydn's place and he must have given the copy. And I always thought, well, what, what must Haydn have taught at evening at dinner? I don't think that he was very talkative to his wife. Uh, this music is very, very new for the time. It's announcing a complete new era. It's, it's incredible. And um, uh, accidentally or not, but Haydn uh, did only compose his last uh, big sonata in, in E flat major in 1794. He ordered also a clavichord, a um, Bohak a big one, five octaves instrument is still existent. And that's his last keyboard piece. And I can imagine that he really saw Beethoven uh, in Beethoven a kind of successor for his own work. I don't know, it's just an idea, but this music is really incredible. So I think let's just, let's, let us start the first movement, maybe last movement. Um, one thing that is very difficult to me is the decision what tempo I should uh, take and the tempo I chose for tonight are rather fast, I think, um, certainly for the last movement and for the first movement I can imagine also for certainly the last and the first movement other tempo which we in a minute about that. First movement, how did I decide the tempo? It's of course the bar structure is four, it's, it's the alla breve sign, but it's, it's, it is a kind of alla breve. Beethoven is really referring to the old music as Bach did. I mean, this is a, this is a clear alla breve. So you have one strong beat per, per bar and one light beat. And I think when you have in the middle section, this part that's indicating for me indica an indicator for the tempo. You have the left hand. That is And emphasize the, the first note because that's the main note. You have the eighth note. Don't play it like I I wouldn't wouldn't play it like that. Because it stands still there, you have to emphasize the, the quarter note. struggled with and I, I must say honestly that I still am not sure what to do about this is this ending of the first phrase you have this big fortissimo and then he ends it as if he is 
thinking in a four four bar structure i mean you you, you could you could easily do this hold it longer and i think you can do that but actually didn't write it so On the other hand, and that's the decision I took tonight. By the way, if you, are, if you, if I doubt about the tempo, and I mean doubting in the sense you have many more options, um, you have to, you have always, you have to choose one decision because if you doubt during the performance, um, it it is not one decision, not the other. It's not. It's just in the middle. You can you can't drive in the middle if you have an artistic performance. You have to choose. So. If I choose this tempo, I have to find a solution for that. And if you play it as it's written, then you understand the organ, uh, the fermate. I mean, there's a fermate here on after the uh, the choice of uh, ornament, and that's important. Listen to that. It is us. The listener and also the performer thinks this is really a very sudden uh, ending and how can it go, how can it proceed? Well, by just uh, taking up the theme again. So that might make sense, I think. If you proceed and there's a very strange thing in the right hand on the B flat show you there is a crescendo and decrescendo sign on one note and he repeats it afterwards in the second uh, uh, when the same figure comes a second time so how can you make a crescendo and a decrescendo on the same note and of course in piano class I've been taught that it is an M you should suggest it, and of course that's that's true. Dum 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 bum. But I'm not saying that this is clavichord music, but the clavichord is the only instrument where you can make this accent very easily. And you 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 you, you even don't have to add the bib. But it's a natural thing to do. So clearly, Beethoven had the tradition of a clavichord player. He had lessons with Neef in Bonn, and uh, Reicha was his, his fellow student. And Reicha did compose much more, many pieces for clavichord, even very late. So yeah, for what instrument is it written? Uh, you can't do this on a pianoforte, certainly not on, on, a, on a harpsichord. I don't think that is harpsichord music anymore, even though many sonatas, uh, also the pathetic, are, have been published uh, with the title for pianoforte, older harpsichord, um, what's that in German anymore? Uh, harpsichord, anyway. Can't switch from one language to another. But um, realize that in that time, publisher added their own titles just for things that were good in the market so the pianoforte obviously was was the most instrument that was coming not all in, not all people had uh, clavichords be, uh, pianofortes because they were very expensive but again then what's what's the use of this crescendo and decrescendo of one note <laughs> It's so logical when you play the clavichord to make an accent on that. Further on, you have this little ornament. That is a little bit out of tune instrument, it's no problem. Okay. How do you do that? On a clavichord, it's very easy. I'm not saying that it is clavichord music, but it translates very well to the instrument. Also here, the preparation for the uh, 
for the uh, reprise. Left hand has crescendo, right hand um, it stays piano, pianissimo. It works great on the clavicle, also on the piano. you have this big chord they go per bar and then then it ends a little bit easier okay that's for the first part as i said we can go on forever the very beautiful second part don't underestimate these second movements these adagios from beethoven they are really fabulous he has not always and that's an understatement the power of a melody of that mozart could give to an adagio or later Schubert would give, but what he does with the, with the uh, ornamentation is really and so modern. I mean, it's just one thing I show you here. What to think about this chord? It's so beautiful, and he is just announcing this chord again at the end of the second movement. At the right time, really fabulous. Then the trio minuet and trio, very classical. And then the last movement. What to do about the last movement? <laughs> you have very um, opposite uh, parts. You have the beginning, and then you have the middle part. It's really a very large dialogue. With long notes so again here you can you can think on playing it much slower also I choose to play it faster that in this part you can you can sound a little bit hurry but um, again that's a choice um, if I practice a piece if I play the piece I come always in the same tempo and that's the reason I choose for it if you play it a little bit faster you can have a little of bit of feeling of drive remember in the Haydn sonata the last one we did I told you at, about a metrical feeling so that you just waited for the next beat to come and the tension is within the beat uh, here it changes so yeah, here it changes to the larger larger sentences not too much but a, a bit and the left hand has a very rhythmical pulse so the the quarter note should have a significant significant meaning so not like this but give him a little push and suddenly there is a, a even there a kind of dialogue so it is so wonderful I mean you have here the melody right hand but on the third triplet with your rhythmical addition of and then comes a passage where I sometimes think this could be slow also as well because the endings are difficult then And then it says, not really piano, 
Mano. Jenny White's Crescendo und das rechte Hand sehr kantabel und laut. Ja, of course, Jenny had a different piano. But the instruments of the 18th century and certainly the clavichord, the left hand, and certainly this instrument is very present. So, nothing to do about that. It's, it's, a, it's a useless struggle to make this sound pianissimo, as you could do on a grand piano. So the left, the right hand has to cope with that. And uh, oh, I just don't um, care too much. I mean, the rhythmical pulse here is very important. <laughs> left hand to make the crescendo of the right hand. Certainly the bass jump pom 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 pom. exposition to the first to the beginning that's so difficult because there is a building of tension in the left hand there's not one single moment you can take a little break to relax as you would possibly can do on the piano so is this clavichord music this is fair this is for my feeling this is written really on the and the idea of the piano but again the sound of this instrument is actually um, making it possible and I, I really don't know I really don't know but Beethoven I, I think it's it's it's, it's yeah, it will sound beautiful on the piano but I don't think that he would be surprised us here tonight uh, playing this music on the clavichord not at all I think it was very obvious okay don't be afraid for the last. It's not too difficult, but if you play this on a concert, really you'll get nervous for the last thing because every sound and massive sound falls away and there's only this little one, one single note chord that's, that's left. So it's very frightening actually. Um, I've played it a few times on, on, on concerts. So, um, we touched just briefly on some things and as I said that has been a very long week for me so I think we close here maybe we come back to the Beethoven Sonata or maybe the three Beethoven Sonatas when we do the recordings of the others in a separate vlog series too much to be to talk about so in the meantime I thank you for watching this long vlog I thank you for subscribing and thank you for sharing this video with your friends. Don't forget to watch the studio project. There is a, a very exciting interview with Philip Newell. I think uh, it's very worth uh, listening to him. And so, thanks for your time. And we see each other next time again. Good evening. Bye.